All right, guys, T. Curtis here. We nerd television. We're gonna go in and check out uh, one of the masters here. He's working here, so we're not gonna interrupt him too much. Mr. Kyle Cushman. Hello, everybody. So, Kyle, how long have you been growing? Uh, about three or four hours now. Today. <laughs> Your history of growing? Oh, man. I've been growing since uh, 1989. Okay. And uh, where'd you start? Back east, out in you know, the west? I started in a walk-in closet in a two-bedroom condominium that I rented in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Awesome. Much like the rest of us, I started in the basement, so. A friend of mine that had been fronting me weed for years came to me and said, hey, I'll teach you how to grow if you let me grow in your closet. He brought me over at Emily's Garden. He brought me over a container of Grow A and B Bloom and some pH test strips. And he said, this is what you do, one teaspoon per gallon. The first buds I ever grew were the size of soda cans. How awesome. First buds I ever grew. Very cool. What are we doing here, monopole? This is a monopole technique where you can, you can put one pole in a bucket and attach all your branches to one pole. Ooh. And the way you do it is, you take a piece of garden tape, wrap it over the top like this, hold it down, wrap it three or four times, and make yourself a loop. Boom. Very cool. Support. So you can tie all of these to one branch. Gotcha. It's like you're making a scaffolding. So Kyle was just explaining to me a little bit of support here. He's going to go off this main post here, and this is going to support this guy, and he's going to take some string and support the other branches. So we're just going to watch yeah, him Yeah, use a combination of uh, garden tape. You want to use a combination of the garden tape and the twist ties. If you use garden tape for every branch, you wouldn't have any light penetrating in because there's so many, so many strands. Gotcha. So what I do is I switch off, and now if you come over here, see I've got these two branches here that are getting ready, they're gonna fall like this. Right. So I'm gonna tie this one to this one, and then tie this one to this one. So you got a nice line of, of support. Very cool. The important thing when you do this is you wanna make sure that you leave a little loop. Right. You don't want to tie it tight or you want to leave a little... Absolutely, a little give. ...for the plant to grow. Right. And then just go around here by a node where it's not going to slide downward. Give a little twist. Doesn't take much to secure it. So now you've got those two t set, uh, attached. And now I'll put a little one in between here. Um, it's just like you're scaffolding a skyscraper. Gotcha. Voila. Very cool. Thanks for the tip. When we were talking last time, Kyle, we were talking about curing um, your flowers after they've been harvested. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's almost an art as much as growing and anything else. What's your what's your process for um, curing flowers af after you've harvested them, and um, what's your process basically? Well, uh, curing starts with a proper dry. You can't cure until you dry properly. Okay. Drying is separate from curing. Gotcha. So you got to dry the weed properly so that it smokes properly, and. Uh, once it's dried properly, then you can put it in a jar. And uh, a lot of people like to burp the jars and check them. I'm kind of past all that. I'm at a point now where I can kind of judge the right amount of moisture and I just kind of jar it up. A week later, I'll check it. If it smells good, I'll leave it for a couple months. Gotcha. It just takes a trial and error. Right, right, because we were talking last time as you said, you don't open the jar where some people will burp it, as you said, every week or, you know, whatever their time schedule is. And I, I agree with you more where you well, have... There are, there are gases that are uh, accumulated when you're curing that, that you want to keep in the jar. Gotcha. Um, and every time you open the jar, you let in more oxygen. The oxygen has been eaten up by aerobic bacteria. And you want the aerobic bacteria to finish up the oxygen and die, and if you open it up and you let in more oxygen, then the aerobic bacteria get to stay alive and keep living, and 
You'll end up with the... You can end up with ammonia. Gotcha. Because, you know, I like to get an intense cure. You can only get an intense cure if you leave moisture in the bugs. Gotcha. Yeah, people usually only burp it because they didn't jar it at the right time in the first place. Let's see how that goes. Now, a lot of people think that curing is aging. Aging is aging. Right. Curing is a complex uh, process of aerobic bacteria eating chlorophyll and uh, and then time allowing the THC molecule to rotate which makes it more more potent okay so curing really if you're really gonna get an intense cure then you're jarring the weed a little bit before it's actually ready for smoking in other words when you take when I take out my weed that I'm curing it's, too, it's still a little bit too moist. You okay. want to leave it out on the table for a couple of hours. Right. And then it'll crisp up. Gotcha. That's how you know you got a good cure going on. Okay. If you open up your jar and it's ready to break up and it's not really curing very intensely. Right. You're aging it, it's going to mellow somewhat, but you're not getting that intense cure. Okay. Where the THC molecule actually becomes more potent. Okay. Very cool. So what are you working on here? Well, we're taking these massively oversized plants and we are staking them up. There are massively oversized plants. How tall are you, Kyle? I'm six foot. That's a tall plant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scrunch under six foot, about that much. That's well over six foot. And yeah, that's, are... that's over a six foot plant. What, what kind of plants are we looking at here? Strawberry cough, ghost train haze, alpha dog. Uh, we have quite a selection of kosher kushes. As you can see, we'll try and uh, get a light view, but a lot of strawberry cough. Where'd strawberry. You, where'd you find the cut of strawberry cough? What's that? Where'd you find the cut of strawberry? What are you talking about? That's my baby. It follows me wherever I go. Well, what's the parents of it? Strawberry cough? Strawberry cough's lineage is a little bit mysterious. Um, it was actually made by a novice grower in upstate Connecticut, first time cross. Very cool. Uh, strawberry Fields crossed with Hayes. Wow. Strawberry Fields is a, uh, an old time New York, upstate New York strain. Okay. Uh, reportedly it was grown, a guy grew it for several generations amongst his strawberry strawberries. Very cool. And it it uh, developed the flavor of the smell of strawberry. I can understand that. By growing for so many years in the same fields. Absolutely. But that's extinct, and uh, Strawberry Cough is just a legend now. Very cool. That happens to be my favorite smoke. It's, what I only, it's the only thing I smoke during the daytime. I've tried it. It's, it's delicious. Yeah. Subs and tried it, Miss Jill, and we all, we all enjoyed it. It's, it's really all I'll smoke in the daytime. And if I'm working, I can't smoke anything else. I got gotcha. you. One more stick from over here. Of course. Now, you're pretty well known for your uh, veganics. How did that all come about? Well, um, I've been growing organically for 20 some years. And uh, I had a friend who was an actual vegan. Okay. And one day he said to me, and he was kind of a, a, a two, uh, uh, not a, I was a tutor. He was the, he was kind of a student of mine. I was teaching him how to grow. Gotcha. And he uh, told me about a new soil that came out from Canada that was vegan. Okay. The Canada BioTerra Plus, which was only available for about a year in America, and now you can't buy it anymore. And so I tried the soil, and it was the first time in my life that I didn't have to pH. Right. Didn't have to use any perlite. Right. Um, and that's what kind of opened my eyes up to veganic. So then the next cycle I tried their nutrients, the kind of bio nutrient line. Okay. And again, and I grew the healthiest plants I ever had. I didn't have to do any pHing, but I found that I had to do a lot of augmenting. Okay. Seaweed and nature's nectar and cow mag and all these various things. Right. And uh, that's what basically led me to want to design my own nutrient line. Sure. So now we're months away from the launch of Vegan Matrix. That's awesome. 
And, and where are we going to be, be able to find these things once it goes live, or can you not disclose well, that? Hopefully you're going to be able to find it everywhere. But uh, we haven't exactly figured out our distribution yet. Okay. Very cool. Well, we appreciate your time, and um, we'll get, let you get back to business, and um, you have yourself a dank day. Cool. Thank, Thank you very much. All right. Anytime.